Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about a subject that's near and dear to my heart, which is pituitary tumors. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a whirlwind tour, starting with anatomy, a little bit of physiology, a little bit of the clinical syndrome, and then spend a good part of the hour talking a little bit about surgery, advances in surgery, how technology has completely revolutionized the treatment of these patients, and actually taken an operation that is very high morbidity and mortality to almost outpatient brain surgery. So I'll start with a little bit of anatomy, and it's very interesting that, you know, the pituitary gland is actually two glands. It's formed from an upgrowth of the mouth and a downgrowth of the brain. The two come together and form one gland, but the back part of the brain is neural, and the only communications are through ner nerves that run from the hypothalamus and thalamus down into the pituitary. But all the secretory part in the front is actually, um, has no nerve connection. The way that that works is that there's a, a portal system. There's a series of, of veins, uh, and the hypothalamus then releases substance into these veins. These veins then take the substances into the anterior pituitary and actually regulate secretion. So this little thing that's about 13 millimeters in diameter has a very complex set of regulatory pathways. The pituitary gland is located at the base of the skull. And I don't know if we're seeing this. I don't see the uh, mouse, but uh, the pituitary gland is located at the base of the skull. And so that is a very challenging thing because it used to be the only way to get there would be to make a craniotomy from ear to ear, lift the brain up, go in from the bottom. Uh, but now we can go through the nostril, through the sphenoid sinus. The sinus is this air sinus. And I, again, I don't think anybody is seeing this because I'm not seeing it on the screen here. But there's an air sinus right here. So going up through the nostril, one can access the pituitary gland without ever having to open the skull or retract the brain at all. I'm um, just trying to see if I can get a pointer, a laser pointer. Let's see if that works. Yeah, so here we go. So again, this area here is a hollow air sinus. So instead of doing a craniotomy and coming in from above and lifting the brain up, which was how it used to be done, we can now go through the nostril into the sinus, remove the bone, and we're looking at the pituitary. Now, the pituitary is around a lot of very important real estate. Right above the pituitary are the optic nerves and the optic chiasm, so if a tumor grows up, it will press on these nerves and cause visual loss, first from the outside, then from the inside. To the side of the pituitary are the main arteries of the brain, the carotid arteries. And it's a very unusual structure in that this is one of the few areas in the body where an artery actually runs inside a big vein called the cavernous sinus. And so until recently, it was an absolute no-no to go here because the incidence of carotid injuries and strokes was very, very high. So if you did pituitary surgery when I trained, you basically took out the tumor that was in the cell or in the pituitary compartment. When you saw the edge of the vein, that was it. You stopped. Well, that's a lot different now. And this is just kind of another view to show you the advantage of this big sinus. So here's this big hollow air sinus. Here's the pituitary gland. So coming up through the nose, you have a lot of access to reach this. And you can see the two glands in one. You can see the pituitary stalk connecting to the brain up here, going to the back part of the pituitary where the nerves go. And then the front part of the pituitary is going to have veins bringing these releasing factors to them. So there are a number of different pituitary tumors. And I'm not going to go through all of them because of the interest of time. Uh, but there are three main secretory syndromes in which a pituitary tumor makes too much of a hormone and therefore you get symptoms from hormonal excess. And then there are tumors that just destroy the pituitary, and you get the opposite. You get hypopituitarism, you get loss of pituitary function, and then the end organs that are triggered by the pituitary aren't working right. Thyroid, adrenal, uh, tes testicles, ovaries, people, uh, women are infertile, men have erectile dysfunction because they have low T. So uh, there are really two different types of tumors. So I'm gonna quickly touch on the three main secretory syndromes and then go on to how, what we do with them. So first is prolactin. So prolactin is a very interesting hormone. Prolactin is a pregnancy hormone. So if you're a woman and you're pregnant, your prolactin normally should be about 18. It goes to like five or 10,000. What does that do? It stops your menstrual cycle, which of course you want to stop. You don't want to lose the baby. 
makes your breast a little bit bigger and makes them make milk. So that's a normal hormone, and that is, tr when you're pregnant, that the pituitary is triggered to just start pouring all that out. But if you get a pituitary tumor, then you can get too much prolactin, and you can get kind of a pseudo-pregnancy type situation, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, if you're a man and you get prola high prolactin, it just knocks out your sexual function. We don't really know what prolactin does in men. I'll never forget, I had a man who had a, a very, very high prolactin and had a very bad erectile dysfunction and was treated with electroshock therapy for 10 years. Came in the office, he was just sad and depressed. And we operated on him, and then he came in about, uh, two, about six weeks later all smiling. His wife was scowling a little bit, but that's another story for another day. So people with uh, prolactin tumors, uh, women, get amenorrhea, loss of menstrual period, prolactorrhea, discharge of milk from the breast. A significant number of women undergo a, a infertility workup, and that's when it's found. Psychiatric changes, weight gain, uh, men impotence and uh, loss of secondary sex characteristics. Now, if you look at this stuff and these symptoms, for many, many years, these were just goofy men and women, right? People, uh, in, uh, primary care doctors kind of blew it off, didn't really know about pituitary physiology, and said, well, this is kind of psychiatric. You know, your periods are off, your your, your weight gain, your sexual dysfunction, but it turns out it's all due to prolactin. So that's the, the first syndrome. It's, it's, it's pr the most common hypersecretory syndrome see an awful lot of people with it. The second is growth hormone. So growth hormone is a, is a very, very important substance. It's actually triggered by the hypothalamus releases something called growth hormone releasing factors, triggers the pituitary to make growth hormone, and that feeds back. And if you have too much growth hormone, you get really sick. You get a condition called acromegaly. You get high blood pressure. You get cardiomyopathy because your heart muscle just grows so much that it doesn't pump right. You get coronary artery disease and heart attacks. You get diabetes. You get crippling arthritis because your joints just grow very dysmorphically. Sexual dysfunction. Carpal tunnel syndrome, very, very common symptom because the, the ligament thickens in the carpal tunnel and compresses the nerve. In fact, when I took my board exam, that was my first question. It was a carpal tunnel syndrome. And then by the time I was finished with the question, I was operating on the pituitary because it was a patient who had acromegaly. Um, the, the cardiac disease is really severe. They get uh, uh, LVH, they get altered systolic time intervals, they get bad cardiomyopathy. And then if you see an acromegalic patient, and I'm going to show you a picture in a second, it's very classic. There's funny facial features. Their jaw sticks out. Many of them go to dentists because their teeth don't occlude right anymore. They get spinal stenosis because of overgrowth of tissue in the spine. They get carpal tunnel. They get very big hands and feet. I never forget, I saw somebody had a size 17 triple E foot. I didn't know they even measured them that high. Uh, and then they get a lot of swelling. So this is actually Harvey Cushing's first patient, who uh, Harvey Cushing, for those of you who don't know, was the father of American nurse surgery. This was a, char a patient of Charles Mayo from the Mayo Clinic. And you can see how he looked before. He was a relatively handsome young man. And then here's this classic look of this sort of thick and large kind of faces as we call it. And then later on, it gets better, but the bone doesn't shrink. So you still have some of the original changes. Now, if you happen to get this before you're, 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 if you reach puberty, you become a giant uh, because your growth plates aren't closed. So this is the Alton Giants, kind of a famous guy. He was nine feet, eight inches tall. Uh, and he had a growth hormone tumor, but it happened before puberty. So his bone just grew and grew and grew. Most of these people are very severely ill because their body structure and habitus isn't really designed to handle all of this. Uh, and this guy, I, this guy was terribly ill. He had very bad spinal stenosis. He could barely walk. And if you look at, uh, in the UK, where they look at acromegaly a lot, uh, after the age of 45, your death rate is twice that of the normal population. So this is a life-threatening endocrinopathy. It's not just that you look funny and you have spinal stenosis and carpal tunnel syndrome. You're going to die from a stroke or a heart attack, or bad diabetes, or something like that. So it, it definitely needs to be treated. Finally, there's Cushing's disease, which is due to too much ACTH. ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, stimulates the adrenal glands to release cortisol. You don't think about people having steroids, but we can't live without steroids. And so this is the most severe syndrome in terms of illness. These people have intractable hypertension. Sometimes they're on three or four or five medications. They have brittle diabetes. They have bad cardiac disease. Because of the excess of steroids, they have myopathy. 
their muscles are really weak. You see them walking like this, they almost like, look, I have Parkinson's disease. And they have a very classic look too, and those of you who take care of people on steroids, a lot of our patients on steroids, you know what it looks like. They have this kind of moon facies, they have what we used to call a buffalo hump, the politically correct statement is now an increased cervical dorsal fat pad. They have very thin skin, it's very easy to tear the skin, which you can see in people on steroids. They get all kinds of stria and marks on their abdomen, they bruise easily, they get acne. And uh, they, one of the things they get that's really bad is severe compression fractures because the exteroid excess makes the bones very brittle. And uh, this is the kind of the look. You can see this sort of we call centripetal obesity kind of in the belly. You see the stria. And if you look at this guy here, you can see that kind of moon facies that's so classic for acromegaly, I mean for, uh, for Cushing's disease. So those are the three main syndromes. There's a big workup for them. I don't have time to go into that. But I do want to tell you that here at Houston Methodist, we can do all of that. We're, 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 we're totally equipped to do all the endocrine evaluation and, and do the workup and, and sort it out. And sometimes it's not as straightforward as it looks here. But uh, nonetheless, these are very serious disorders. Two out of the three I've described are life-threatening. The third one is very frustrating. It's frustrating for women who want to have babies, women who don't understand why their periods have stopped and why, why I'm having breast milk, men who have sexual dysfunction. And a lot of those patients are blown off. You know, pituitary tumors are found in 10% of autopsies. So they're common. Uh, there's lots of people out there that are having symptoms who either haven't gone to the doctor or the doctor hasn't quite made the connection. So I want to talk a little bit about surgery. Um, and first, somebody should sing the national anthem. Uh, but before I talk about surgery, I want to talk about technology. So you know, when our patients come to us today, they have incredibly high expectations, right? I mean, you go buy a car and you'll argue with the salesman about a six disc CD changer longer than the patient who comes in and lets you lay down and cut their head open. So they have incredible trust. They're like this goldfish. They jump in the air and they're just sure you're gonna move the fishbowl so they jump in. And so that's our responsibility. It's a very big responsibility and technology has really exploded in allowing us to do this. And so if you go to neurosurgical conventions you see us, we love tools. If we can find a new gadget or gizmo, we're all there. There can be some Nobel Prize winner lecturing and everyone's down looking at the, at the, new, the new gizmos and the exhibits. And we love to debate. We, we think that the way we do it is best. We all have all these lectures, how I do it. Uh, and you know, we're very dedicated that our way is the best way, uh, that everyone else's way is wrong. But coming out of all of that debate has come an explosion in technology that really is remarkable. And the reason that surgical technology has improved is really for three things. Number one is visualization. We're able to see things better than we ever could before. And you know, if you can't see what you're doing, it doesn't matter how good you are, right? Second is navigation. Where are we exactly in the brain? There are 30 billion neurons in the brain. Right? So we don't want to turn right when we're supposed to turn left. So how do we navigate around? How do we know where we are? And then the third thing is minimally invasive surgery. So you see that everywhere, right? Nobody gets a big incision for a gallbladder anymore. They pop an endoscope in. Well, I'm going to show you how we pop endoscopes in as well. And so neurosurgery has really reinvented itself. And just for some examples, so this is a tool that the plumber uses when he sticks it down your drain trying to figure out where the clog is. Pretty crude, but works. This is an MRI scan so good that we can see a single neuron. So that's kind of the spectrum of where we've gone for, uh, for visualization. Navigation in 1990s, we used ultrasound. This is a patient who had a craniotomy for a tumor. We stuck the ultrasound on the head. You can see where there's this kind of bright area, kind of like an ultrasound for a baby. We took the tumor out. We said, yeah, we did pretty well. Now we are so good that we can go into 3D virtual reality and we can actually put an Oculus Rift helmet on and walk through the brain, turn around, look at the tumor, and see where it is. And this is a patient with a pituitary tumor, and I'm going to show you just that. So we're actually able to fly in. We're going to go right through the nose. And you can see the tumor kind of here at the base of the skull. And we're going to go in. Now here we are looking from above. There's the optic nerves pushed way up. There's the carotid arteries. There's the basilar artery. And if you actually walk with this thing, the, everything moves. 
And now we can look and see how much involvement is there with the carotid artery. Remember we talked about, so you can see here it's tucked underneath the carotid. So you can do a virtual walkthrough and know exactly what it is you're gonna see before you even start the operation. That's how good it is these days. And then finally, minimally invasive surgery using an endoscope, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. So our neurosurgeons today look like nerds. We have all sorts, we are nerds. We have all sorts of novel technology, and you look at our machines and our gadgets, and it looks kind of like this guy. You say, what the heck is that? But it works. So let's talk about the old way, the better way, and the new way. So the old way to do these surgeries was pretty, pretty heavy. We had to make an incision from ear to ear, peel the scalp down to the nose, open up the base of the skull, and then lift the brain up to go this way. You can see here's the olfactory nerves. The pituitary would be just underneath here. Pretty big operation. The patient was in the hospital for a couple weeks. A little goofy, confused, a little frontal lobe syndrome for a while. Most people did all right. Then came the idea of going through the nose, but we didn't really know how to do that. So what we did is we would make an incision underneath the lip and lift, the, lift this up and go up that way. And so it was still an incredible advance, but the patient had a, a numb teeth, numb uh, face. Uh, they, uh, they had terrible sinus problems. I mean, you kind of lifted the face up, but that was still so much better than, uh, than before. And then along came the surgical microscope, which revolutionized our ability to see, uh, but there were limitations. And here's just kind of an illustration of the limitation. The way we did it with the microscope is we put a little speculum in, and what you could see was just where the speculum was aimed. You couldn't see up here, you couldn't see there. But an endoscope has almost a 180 degree view and you can move it around. So you can put an endoscope here and you can see way up here. And so there's a much wider field of view. So the new way is to use an endoscope, put it up through the nostril, put it in the sinus, look at the pituitary, and actually we can reach the entire base of the skull from the frontal sinus up here all the way down to the brain stem. And I'm gonna show you a couple of quick examples of that. So it's come from you know, a gargantuan operation with all kinds of morbidity to almost outpatient brain surgery, and I'll show you why I say that. So I think maybe Pablo Picasso was thinking about that when he painted this painting. So what's an endoscope? An endoscope is a slender rod with a camera on the end of it. It's attached to a holder. It actually now has 1080p Blu-ray high def. You can angle it so you can put it in and look at it. Look, you can put it in this way and look over here. Uh, we are going to get a 4K system very soon, but even now we have 1080p Blu-ray resolution. 8K is coming. I don't know what the heck that is, except it's probably twice 4K, and it's probably really good resolution. And we have a 3D endoscope, and I'm going to talk to you about that at the very end, because that's the future. It's kind of what it looks like. It has a little camera that guts on it. It has a machine that washes the blood off of it. It has a tower. Now we actually have the ceiling-mounted towers. And then we have a robot. We have a robot in the OR that holds the endoscope. So this thing is kind of like a fancy schmancy pneumatic arm. You can position it in any position you want, and then you can still work with two hands because the robot's holding the endoscope. We also have virtual reality. I don't have time to go through all this, but you know, we now can make special MRI scans. We can fuse arteries and veins with brain, and then we can register the patient and we can touch any place on the patient's head, and we can see where we are with one millimeter accuracy, and this is actually a, an MRI where we even can reconstruct the fiber track. So that enables us, as we're working, to see exactly where we are, so minimally invasive skull-based surgery is born. Okay, so how do we do it? So I'm just gonna run you through quickly what an operation looks like, and I'm gonna show you some videos about how we actually can do the surgery. We position the patient kind of in a sitting position, and we put in a lumbar drain. So we do a spinal tap and put in a lumbar drain. So why would we do that? I'm gonna give you a little hint, and I'm gonna show you an incredible video. If you're an obstetrician and you wanna deliver the baby, what do you do? You tell the woman to push, right? If you don't push and the baby won't come down, you have to do a C-section, right? So if you've got a big tumor growing way up into the brain, you don't want to, we don't want to pull on it because it might be some, stuck to something on the other end. So just by putting uh, sterile saline into the CSF spaces, it increases the pressure and actually pushes the tumor down to us. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So there's the robot, the Mataka arm, and you can see really all that's 
all that's available for view is the nose, right here. We have all these drapes, but basically all that's exposed is the nose. And we have a microscope as well, so at times we can look through the nose with the microscope. Sometimes that's a little better than the three, uh, better 3D than the endoscope, so we have both sort of things. And so when the surgery first came out, people were really afraid of how to go in the nose, how do you navigate, how do you make it work, and it turns out that the nose, with apologies to Dr. Takashima, is a pretty simple organ compared to the brain. And there's just a couple of knobs here and there to move out of the way. So let me tell you how that works. So this is, a, uh, this is how the operation starts. This is an idealized picture. You put the endoscope into the nose, and as you know, there's turbinates, these little filters. And so this is the inferior turbinate, this is the middle turbinate, this is the midline here, this is the nasal septum. And back here is the superior turbinate, where all the smell and olfaction is. So we expose that, and the next step is we just push these over a little bit. And by the way, once we push them over, we can, we can put them back again. We, we don't take out the turbinate. That was another thing that people used to do. They would resect all this stuff in the nose, and people's noses would be all messed up. We just move them aside. And as you move it aside, you see a little hole here, and that is called the sphenoid sinus osteum. That is actually the entrance into that sinus where the pituitary sits. So we, we open this up a little bit more, and we can see this, the, sign, the opening very, very well. And then here's a real-time picture, and what you're seeing here is we've moved the nasal septum over to one side. This is the bone behind the nasal septum. This is one opening into the sphenoid sinus. This is the other opening to the sphenoid sinus. So we're all the way up back to the sinus, and that takes about five or 10 minutes to do once you know the anatomy. It's not really that complicated to make the exposure. Then, once we're in the sinus, we're going to open the sinus widely, and we use various punches and different, device, different instruments to do that, and we end up with this view. And to me, even every time I see this, this is an incredible view, because what are you looking at? Right here, you're looking at the cella. On either side are the carotid arteries, and you can actually see the, the bone bulges out, so you actually see the carotid arteries. Down here is the clivus, which is the beginning of the brain, where the brainstem sits. Up here is the, what's called the planum sphenoidale, which is the frontal lobes are sitting right up here. Here are the optic nerves right here, just underneath the bone. So all this big time real estate is right in front of you. Uh, and, very, very, and you get a view that looks pretty much like this. Once you get that view, what we do is we drill and we open up. And so here's a real-time view, and you can see us using a high-speed diamond drill to drill the bone off. And this is the dura, or the lining around the pituitary. And this is a punch that's only two millimeters in diameter. It looks huge under the endoscope. And so we open all this up because we want to expose from one carotid artery, which is going to be over here somewhere, to the other carotid artery that's over here. And so uh, we open all this up. It looks a little bit bloody. This is actually a microscopic amount of bleeding. Uh, in fact, if you do a CBC at the end of the case, you really don't see any difference. And so here you can see now the cavernous sinus and the carotids on both sides. So here's the pituitary and here's the excess. And so now these are little coagulators and these are little scissors. And I'm starting to open the dura or the lining of the pituitary. And right there is going to be the tumor. Now, depending on the tumor, we have to do different things. If it's a microadenoma or a small tumor, the goal of the surgery is to peel the microadenoma away from the pituitary gland. And in, in, in my series, I've done over about 4,400, about a 97% preservation of pituitary function. So we're almost always able to separate the microadenomas from the normal gland. This is a very common pa question that patients ask, and I think some doctors think too, oh yeah, they go in there and they take out the whole pituitary. No. We now, with this type of technology and this visualization, remember I talked about visualization, navigation, and minimally invasive, right? We're able to, I would say, almost always separate the two. And when we can, it's because there's almost no pituitary left. Now, if there's a bigger tumor, it's more of a challenge, but we can still separate the two because normally the tumor will squish the pituitary back or over to one side. So as long as you're careful, you can still preserve pituitary function. So here's what it looks like to take the tumors out. Uh, so we're going to open up the dura or the lining of the brain a little bit more now. And you see the tumor looks kind of squishy and soft. 
And I'm going to take these little ring curettes, and here comes the tumor, and it kind of looks like soup, doesn't it? Sometimes they're a little firmer than this, but usually that's what they look like. That's also a two millimeter biter, so that's, you know, it looks huge here. And then just working slowly and carefully, you can dissect this tumor down and get, get a whole lot out. So that you'll, you'll see us just working for a while. I'm going to need to go up a little higher here, so I'm going to make an incision up further. Here comes the incision up further, get a little better exposure. Now here comes a whole lot of tumor. Look at that. It's a boy. Boom. Keeps coming. Maybe it's a girl. Uh, so that's, that's what that looks like. Now here's the lumbar drain business. So you, you know, if you're in this little pocket, you can clean that pocket out pretty well. But up there is tumor, brain, optic nerves, carotid arteries. You can't see any of it. So we use the obstetrics approach. But since the patient's asleep, they can't push. So we push for them. And the way we push is we inject fluid into that lumbar drain. So watch this. This is a patient with a very big tumor. And you can see there's a lot of tumor still left here. So I'm injecting into this lumbar drain. And you'll see kind of in time lapse what happens. I know there's a lot of tumor there, so that's the baseline. Here's 5 cc's. Watch, it's starting to bulge down. You see that? It's coming down just a little. Here comes 10 cc's. Whoa, it's really bulging down. It's going to push the whole thing to me. Now I can take those little curettes. The whole thing's going to just pop down. I would never be able to do that. I would have to pull, which I never want to do. And just working fairly quickly, the rest of the tumor is going to come out. And what you're going to see is the whole capsule of the tumor. This is called the diaphragm celli. This is the arachnoid. Now I can take out fluid, and it's going to go back up. So I can move the whole thing back and forth like an accordion with this very, very simple technique. So that's also, as silly as it seems, has revolutionized our ability to get the tumors out. Now, how do you put it all back together? Well, it turns out it's very simple. We take a little piece of fat from the belly, a little tiny incision, and we fill the hole where the tumor was. Why do we do that? Because we don't want the spinal fluid to leak, and we don't want there to be an empty space. Fat has a low metabolic factor. Fat can live in a bowl for about seven hours. So we, take the, we harvest the fat, put it in some saline, put it back in, and it actually grows and attaches. And years later on an MRI scan, you can still see living fat there. So fat's the skull-based surgeon's friend, really, in that we can, do, we can repair things. Then we want to put the bone back. And so we have this bone substitute. It's called Medpor. It's polyethylene, uh, uh, polypropylene, and it's, it's a porous substance. And it, we put it in underneath the dura, and then over time, bone grows through it. And then we put a little tissue sealant. So here's how that works. See, there's the hole where the pituitary is. Now I'm putting in some fat from the belly. You can see the fat looks like fat. And then here comes that implant. I'm going to snap it in underneath the dura. And I'm going to try to put it in on each side. And then I'm going to make sure that it's, it seals well, because it's like a gasket seal. It's holding everything together. And then we're going to take some tissue glue and just put it on top of it. And that's it. We pull the, we pull the endoscope out of the nose and we're done. So sometimes we have to take a nasal septal flap where we resect the mucosa off the nose. But this technique has avoided that in almost, in almost all cases. And while a nasal septal flap works, uh, you have chronic crusting in your nose for three to six months, sometimes forever. And so just by doing this, we can, we're even more, or even more minimally invasive uh, than we were before. So we do a gasket seal or a nasal septal flap, or both, depending on what we have. Here's the gasket seal, fat, the implant, the glue. The nasal septal flap is rotating a piece of, of mucosa lining the nose and covering the defect, but that is still attached to blood vessels. So it's live tissue, and it seals. So we try to avoid this. We don't get much in the way of nasal septal perforations anymore, again, because of the minimally invasive technology that we have. This guy's got a big hole in his nose, let me tell you. All right. So what about big pituitary tumors? So that's another whole kettle of fish. So here's two patients I had. Here's a patient where the tumor's just everywhere. And obviously, you're not going to be able to go in here and get it all this way. So the goal of this surgery is to remove the tumor in the middle. 
get the pressure off the optic nerves, and then maybe we'll come in by craniotomy, or maybe we can just do radiation. Now, this tumor here is a challenge. It's right in the middle of the brain. Uh, it's, it's, it's really big. Uh, it's almost up, it's pushing the ventricles up. And so again, the goal of that, remember we talked about how the tumor can press on the optic nerves and cause visual loss. So the goal of the surgery here is to get the pressure off the, off the eyeballs and keep our eye on the ball. So that's what he looked like before surgery, really just a gigantic tumor. It's, you know, it's halfway up to the top of the head. And yet, using those techniques, there's another picture of what it looks like. Here he is post-op. So that's the fat which we use to fill up the cella, tumor's gone. And we didn't have, to, we didn't pull, we just used the technique, you know, the obstetrics technique, as I call it, of injecting the fluid in, into, into the spine, into the spinal fluid, and yet letting the pressure deliver the tumor. So that worked out really well. And we do this, I would say, about 40% of the time, because about 40% of the patients have big tumors, and rather than risk damaging things by pulling, we, we, we do it this way. Now, the other big uh, <laughs> bad thing in the house is the carotid artery. So since this whole area is only about this big and the carotid artery is right on the other side, very often the carotid artery is involved. The tumor grows around the carotid, it, so it's the big bad wolf. And nobody wants a carotid injury, so as I told you earlier, the conventional wisdom was to avoid carotid explosions and to not go near the carotid. Don't touch it, don't move it. You know, we don't want to have uh, Trump and, and Korea here. Uh, and so that's what I was taught. But of course, in those days, the resolution wasn't very good, the technology wasn't so hot, and so uh, we were told to leave the cavernous sinus alone, but now, we realize that the, we can divide the cavernous sinus into three areas. So there's the area that's between the pituitary and the carotid, there's the area that's the carotid, and then there's the area behind it. And now, routinely, we go into these two areas, and sometimes we can even reach around the carotid, as I'll show you. So here's a case. Here's a man with acromegaly who we really want to cure him if we can. But we know that right about here is the cavernous sinus. In fact, you can't even see this carotid squished by this tumor. So, you know, ordinarily you say, well, we can take out about this much, but there's no way we're going to go into the cavernous sinus. All right, so here's the exposure, and you see exactly what you saw on the scan. You know, here is the pituitary gland. We haven't opened it yet. Here's the dura. Here is the cavernous sinus, the vein, and here's the carotid artery, somewhere right about here. So you'd say, boy, this is almost a futile operation, right? We're going to go in and, you know, we're going to open it up a little bit. We're going to leave all this tumor. Not true. So that's what it looked like when we were finished. That's the normal gland. Remember how I told you we could take out the tumor and spare the normal gland? The normal gland has this kind of orangey red appearance. There's the cavernous sinus. There's a carotid artery. And we actually have a little hemostatic material here. We actually went beyond the carotid artery. No injury to the carotid, the patient woke up and we were actually able to cure him, which was rather remarkable because once the tumor grows into the vein, the, 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 the cure rate's very, very low. So, uh, you know, again, that's technology. And here's a couple of other videos. Uh, if they play, I think they'll play. Well, why aren't they playing? Let's see. Well, that one's not going to play for some reason. Uh, let me see if I can get rid of this thing. I think I have to get rid of the pointer. Uh, is it going to go off? Okay, yeah, we go. Okay, so there's the carotid artery. You can see I'm pushing on it there. And there's a little pocket in the back, and that's in the cavernous sinus. So you can actually see me working around the carotid, on top of the carotid. Here comes more tumor, sitting on the carotid artery. Something I would never have done in my training and yet I'm in the cavernous sinus and I'm on top of the carotid, so I'm in zone one and two, right? I'm, I'm to the inside of the carotid and I'm on the carotid. And then I was able to get a complete removal with this. And just another example of a little pocket, I'm gonna to try to put this pointer back on just for a second, although it won't play, a little pocket right here in the cavernous sinus. 
I can only just get that out, I can cure the patient. But the carotid's right in my way, right? So, I, you know, again, traditionally, and most people still don't do this because they don't have the technology. But now you're going to see, I'm just going to push the carotid aside. There's a little pocket of tumor. There's a little bit of oozing, which we stop, and the tumor's out. The carotid is right to your right-hand side, and it's filling the field, and no problem. So I'm almost amazed myself when I see us do this because it's, it's just something we could never even think about doing before. Let me show you a little bit more about how much we can see now. So this is a man who had a big cystic mass, and this mass was growing up and compressing his optic nerves. He, he had a bitemporal hemianopsia, which means he lost vision on either side. His optic nerves are pushed way up like a C. Uh, and he's beginning to lose vision in his nasal fields as well. So we put in the endoscope, and this was a, a, a big cystic mass. We were able to drain it, and look what we're able to see. So this is one optic nerve. This is the other optic nerve. This is the optic chiasm. This is what we call the diaphragm celli. And you see all these little vessels here? That's the pituitary stalk flattened to a thin rim coming down from the hypothalamus. So look at the visualization that we have. You can see the arachnoid pulsing with each beat of the heart, something we could just ever, never, ever see. And I'm using an angled endoscope, because if I was looking straight, I would only see about this much. I'm looking at an angle to see it. So again, just something that would, you never really would think we could do before. We can look around the corners. We can look up towards the frontal lobes. We can look back to the posterior fossa. And then when we're finished, you'll see that the endoscope's going to pop out of the nose. You'll see the nose hairs, and we're done. And so it's absolutely amazing to me that we can go to the base of the brain and the patient can go home the next day or two. So this, is, this should end soon. This is kind of, let me see if I can get rid of the laser pointer. Where is it? Hide, no, pointer. Okay. There we go. We're coming out. We're in the sinus. There's the hairs in the nose. We're done. So it is the ultimate minimally invasive surgery, I think. And you know, it's almost like I was going to put the slide in. I didn't. It's a drive-through brain surgery. You know, you pull up to a, a little booth and you put your head in, and the guy does it, and you drive home. Not quite that. Look at this. This is a view of the brain stem. We've drilled off the clivus. There is the basilar artery, and we're pulling what's called an epidermoid tumor off the basilar artery. This is the basilar artery here. These are the posterior cerebral arteries. This is the brain stem. So we're going through the nose, looking at the brain stem, able to peel off these tumors, and really can see incredibly well. This was an area you couldn't even reach. You try to come in from the side behind the ear. You could never really see the center. Now you have the whole thing all uh, laid out for you. So again, just you know, remarkable, uh, remarkable difference. So this is a video, it's on our website, that t tells you what it's like for a patient. So, I mean, it, most patients have an experience pretty much like this, and it's kind of filmed from the patient's perspective. So we talk a little bit about the pituitary, we show you the surgery, you're in the OR seeing what we're doing, you see the family, you see the patient right after surgery, and you see the patient later on. And I show this to those of you who are watching who are not surgeons, you know, what can your patient actually expect if they undergo one of these surgeries? So here we go. So the pituitary gland is the master gland of the body. It's a little P-shaped gland that sits right at the base of the skull. And right above it are the optic nerves. So unfortunately, if the tumor grows upwards, as it did in Mrs. Lester's case, it puts pressure against those optic nerves. And you can actually go blind from these tumors. The tumor is located right over here at the base of the brain. This is a, this white thing is the tumor. The optic nerves would normally be over here and here. They're pushed up and to the side by this tumor that's grown up into the brain. The bigger they get, the more serious it becomes because there's many, many structures in a small space that are critical to brain function. You have the main arteries, the carotid arteries going up, supplying the blood supply to the brain. You have the nerves that control eye movements, and then you have the vision nerves themselves. Right behind the pituitary, you have the entire stem of the brain. So as these tumors grow, they press upon a lot of very important real estate. And one of the critical parts of this operation is that this, these structures here, these little black dots, are the main arteries of the brain called the internal carotid artery. 
So particularly on this side, on the left-hand side, the tumor is sort of like a C around the artery. So as we remove it, there's a risk of tearing the artery and having a stroke. But of course, all these specialized techniques that we have, high resolution, lots of micro instruments, enable us to do that without that happening. This is an interesting instrument. You can position this endoscope, let go of it, and it's going to stay. So this actually adds a third hand to surgery. Many times when we do endoscopic surgery, you're holding the endoscope with one hand and working with the other hand, and as steady as your hand is, you can't hold it precisely still. So sometimes we have an assistant who's holding it, and even that assistant can't hold it as still as you'd like to. So this thing, as simple as it is, it's just a pneumatic arm, has really revolutionized our ability to put this thing in, keep it at the right position, and continue to do the surgery. So it's a fairly high-risk procedure. We're going to come up through the nasal passages to the base of the skull, using this endoscope that's only 2.8 millimeters in diameter, about one-tenth of an inch, and it has 1080p high-def resolution on our screen. So what we're going to see is a very, very precise, crisp and clean image, helping us go somewhere where, it's, number one, it's hard to get to, number two, it's hard to see. So we're enhancing all of our abilities with this technology. All right. So now what we're doing is we're entering into the sinus, we're removing the bone at the base of the skull, at the beginning of the sinus, and then inside the sinus is going to be the floor or the, of the cavity where the pituitary sits. One of the things when you watch this is that it, it looks terribly bloody. Of course, we're, this is microscopic amounts of bleeding. If you do a blood count at the end of the case, you can't even tell there was any blood loss, but when you magnify this up, it looks god awful. This operation capitalizes on several different technologies. One is the minimally invasive way of taking this tiny endoscope and getting exposure, which has a broad, a very wide field of view, but not necessarily three dimensions. And then putting the microscope in, which is a high resolution three dimensional machine. So we're going back and forth, taking advantage of the best of both technologies. These are both tools that are helpful to us as we progress through the operation. It's so very important to have a good team of people to work with you. So the people in this room have probably done hundreds or, or maybe a thousand of these procedures with me. And it, it, makes, it makes a very difficult thing very easy. And so it's really a, a whole team of people that make this a success, not just the surgeon. Using this technology, even though there's a big tumor, her pituitary gland is still there and flattened and we're able to actually separate the tumor from the gland, preserve the gland so she'll still have normal hormone function. In the past, it used to be we would just have to take the whole thing out because our ability to do that separation didn't exist. So one of the challenges was to get this tumor off the artery. Could we do it? Would it tear? Could we get it? We're right up against the vein in the artery. The tumor is peeled away very cleanly. We can see the naked vein and artery completely intact. Very good outcome. Uh, we're, got, we're lucky. So it's done extremely well. There have been no problems, no complications, and uh, we've saved her vision. But she's going to be good. Hello. Your pituitary gland, I was able to save it, I actually peeled the tumor off of it. Yeah. But for a period of time, it made I'm it. surprised that it was this easy. It's been a really good experience, fairly quickly out of ICU. Now I'm resting in the regular room and ready to go home tomorrow. Let's look at your MRI because it's quite remarkable. So what you see here is a comparison of your MRI scans from before and after surgery. So here's this tumor, the normal pituitary would be about this big growing way up into your brain, your optic nerve there should be somewhere here that pushed way up. So this is the tumor? That's the tumor. Here you are now, gone. This is the sinus. Mm -hmm. This is the little rim of pituitary. Here's your optic nerve, just floating. Perfect. We preserve the normal pituitary gland, and the fact that you still feel good and you're not, you know, mm -hmm. feeling sluggish means your pituitary hormones are working. working. I mean, again. we want to get them checked, but uh -huh. awesome. I can tell you that they're working, or you, or you wouldn't feel that way. But basically, you had a brain tumor that was going to take your vision, make you blind, and now it's done. I mean, you saw I was up and about the very next day, and I think um, I was more worried than what 
I was more afraid of the surgery and it was really simple. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you, Great Dr. Baskin. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that that's not, that's not the exception, that's the rule. That's what almost all of the patients look like. And, you know, obviously you don't have to know how to do the surgery, but it's a lot of things. It's the team, it's having everyone who knows what's doing, it's having the technology, having a hospital willing to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in all this stuff, which, by the way, becomes obsolete pretty quickly. We're going to need some new stuff pretty soon. It's almost like when you buy a computer, by the time you decide what computer to buy, the next one's out. But I mean, we're really keeping up, and so you can see what we can do with this. Now, what if you don't get the tumor? There is such a thing called stereotactic radiosurgery. It's an ability to focus a beam very precisely. We just bought a $7 million gamma knife, and we've become experts in that as well. We've learned what doses to give. We can be very, very precise. There's almost no spread of the radiation at all. In fact, uh, we can spare the normal gland, which is right next to whatever residual tumor there is, and we can fractionate. We can give a little bit at a time. And we, I have, in, in the, we've rated about five or 600. We have like one or two minor problems. It's amazing. I mean, actually, we wrote this up in uh, the neurosurgical journals. And I, I think that our results here are pretty much as good, better than most places. And again, I think we have good doctors, but we have great technology. And both those things are what makes the difference. So, I want to declare the relative death of the craniotomy. It's kind of like this uh, old Mac, which I actually had one of these. I can't remember what they were called, but it was the first one. Uh, and it's now growing grass in it. We rarely need to do craniotomies. And it's because we have multiple modalities. We have a whole lot of different options. And in any one case, we're going to sit and say, OK, what are the options we have? What are the technological options? You know, do we bomb North Korea? Do we call Equifax? What are we going to do in this particular case? And it makes a huge difference. So I promised I would talk about the future. So I, we I showed you that virtual reality, and you can put that Oculus Rift helmet and fly around the brain. Before long, you're going to do the whole surgery in virtual reality. That's coming. Uh, robotics, you saw a simple robot. We have six different robots in the OR now. You're going to see robotics for this as well. But what I'm going to focus on in a few many minutes is, is three-dimensional endoscopy. So here's kind of an interesting story. How does, do you know that a bug can see in three dimensions with one eye? If you take out one eye in a bug, kind of a terrible thing to do, but if you do, they have perfect three-dimensional vision. Why? Because each eye has about 150 to 200 eyes in it. A fire ant has 180 eyes in each eye. So think of the processing that that takes, right? I mean, you think it's just two eyes and two visions coming to the brain, the brain fusing it. Each eye in a fire ant has to fuse 180 images. So we came out with some early endoscopes, and they were just, you know, basically two holes. But now they're making these kinds of things where there's multiple, multiple eyes. And it's been a huge challenge for the engineers to do what the brain does naturally, to take all of that information. And we have one of these things. And I want to tell you, when you put it on, it's, and this is just a, showing you that people are studying this now. They're trying to make it better and better. It is, you're dizzy. It's so much three dimensions. It's even more than you're used to. And it gives you an incredible depth. And that's going to be the future. I want to mention that uh, we're at a point now where we're really developing a comprehensive multidisciplinary uh, center with Dr. Takashima from ENT and myself. Uh, Moss is an incredibly talented surgeon, and we're doing lots of these cases together, and we're hoping to get an endocrinologist on the team. And so the patient could come. They could be one-stop shopping. They could see an endocrinologist. They could see me. They could see Dr. Takashima if they needed, we needed him. And then uh, they could also see ophthalmology all in one, one minute. And so I, we're hoping that we'll be able to, to roll that out. We are rolling it out now. Dr. Takashi and I are seeing a number of cases together. And this is just an incredible case that we did last week. And I just want to sort of end with this, and I'll, go, go, I'll finish in a minute. So this was a guy with a gigantic tumor. He had a tumor pushing his frontal lobes way back. I mean, it was about the size of a grapefruit. The tumor grew through the entire base of his skull into his nose. I mean, you could literally look in his nostril and you could see tumors. So this was a case where we had to go above and below. So we did four separate surgeries. And in the last surgery, we went from below 
and cut out all the bone from below. I went from above, cut out all the bone from above. I actually removed most of the eye socket. The tumor invaded into the middle eye socket and the top of the eye sockets. We split the, the, the skull and rebuilt the eye sockets. But this particular picture is kind of a favorite of mine. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking down from the brain and I can see his endoscopes in the nose and there's the nasal septum. He pointed the endoscope up the nose and he can see me standing at the top of the head. So that's the kind of stuff that we're able to do now. I'm giving him a little couple of stuff. So I mean, I think that the old principles are, are no longer there. I mean, we have such an explosion of knowledge and physiology of the pituitary and technology. And so I think we can you know, make the, dan the brain dance and do things we never thought we could do. But I will say that technology requires wisdom. This is a great slide. I, I don't know where I saw this. I took a picture of it and said, this machine has no brain. You have to use your own. And you have to be very careful because these devices will do whatever you tell them to do. They don't think. You have to think. Uh, so I'll end with this. This is one of my favorite uh, movies that, you know, technology has exploded so much that we can really make old dogs do new tricks. We can do things that we never thought we could do. Uh, make cars dance and make the brain dance. And uh, really, it's such an exciting time in neurosurgery. And you know, I, I worry what's going to happen in the future as healthcare gets rationed. But you know, fortunately, we're at the place that it believes in investing te in technology. And so, we literally can make cars dance. So I'll end with uh, Plutarch, who said, "The mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled." We're like this little truck, truck running at about 150 miles an hour, trying to do everything we can to help patients. So with that, I'll end. Uh, if anyone has any uh, questions or interests later on, I have a cell phone that I answer 24-7, 365 days a year. You can email me. I'm always happy to talk to you about a patient with a pituitary or skull-based tumor. Thanks so much. I think we have about seven minutes for questions. That's how I timed it anyway. Maybe nobody has any. Okay, here's one. Could you provide information on specific post-op care and discharge instructions? Yes. In fact, uh, I have a brochure that I give to every single patient when they come in the office to tell them exactly what to expect. However, I can tell you what it is. Uh, patients can get up and walk the next day uh, they can be ambulatory, they can do whatever they want to do. We send them home with a, and they, they go buy something called a Neomed sinus irrigation or neti pot because anytime you do sinus surgery, your sinuses can kind of get gucked up. So by irrigating, you keep them clean. We send them home on a little bit of, uh, we tell them to take some Allegra D, a little decongestant for a few weeks, which by the way is exactly what you would do if you had a sinus operation. And depending on how much preoperative loss of pituitary function there is, We'll send them home on tapering doses of hormone replacement, and then we'll retest that at six weeks. How long after removal of pituitary tumor do you see a difference in vision? If the pituitary tumor was putting pressure on the optic nerves, often almost instantly. It's remarkable. So obviously, the optic nerve doesn't even regenerate. What's happening is that the tumor is choking off the blood supply. But those neurons are not dead, they're idling. I mean, a patient will tell you in recovery, oh my god, I can see so much better. That being said, you, there is a test called optical coherence tomography. The uh, ophthalmologists here know what that is, which looks at the retinal nerve fiber layer in, in the eye. And if you see a lot of loss of that preoperatively, that vision isn't going to come back very much. The goal then is to preserve vision. Uh, but often, patients note a dramatic difference within an hour. What are the ages of the oldest and youngest patients with pituitary tumors? I've, oper I've operated on an 87-year-old man about five, four weeks ago who was losing his vision, who did great, went home in about three days. I kept him an extra day just because, you know, he's not a spring chicken anymore. He's a summer chicken. The youngest, I have done some cases that are seven years. I did a seven-year-old boy with Cushing's who now is actually a doctor and an ophthalmologist. I think he's the youngest I've ever done. All right, any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, just an amazing lecture. Um, I think it's just amazing that uh, how you show like from the past to the present to the future. Um, a great whirlwind tour, I think. 
Um, I guess a technical question, uh, two things. Number one is that uh, you talk about um, the tumor uh, invading into the cavernous sinuses, and the big bad wolf is the um, carotid artery, the, uh, the ICA. How about all the other cranial nerves in that area? I, I suppose that they're all kind of pushed out. Yeah, I'll try, to, I'll try to scroll back. So the, the interesting thing about that anatomy is the cranial nerves are very lateral. So there's, oh, there's almost no risk of damaging the cranial nerves unless you go into that third zone. Here, right, right there. Let me, oh, there it is. We put the uh, pointer back on. So, so here's the medial cavernous sinus. Here's the carotid. The, carotid. the cranial nerves are all pretty lateral. So yeah, once you're reaching around the carotid artery, you've got to be very, very careful. So the Not that would, I've nerve. never injured a cranial nerve. Now, people who have pituitary apoplexy where the tumor suddenly hemorrhages will come in with a cranial nerve palsy because the tumor's pushing the carotid and pushing on the cranial nerves. And usually that gets better when you take it out. But yeah, once you're in zone three, outside the carotid, you've got to be very gentle and careful. And I don't get too aggressive there because we have the focus radio surgery, which can take care of these. One in 10,000 are malignant. So you've got a pretty good chance if you have to leave something, you can clean it up with the radio surgery. But I still like to get out when I can. What's your second question? Well, I mean, following the first, so the abducens nerve is uh, the most medial one. So I guess that's sometimes a little close to the carotid artery. So um, they're all close. You saw the carotid yeah. several, on several of my <laughs> videos. But the, the interesting, as you know, Steve, most of these are soft, so you can peel them off. Now, if this thing is encasing the carotid, forget it. I always talk about the, one of the problems is neurosurgery is wet noodles and concrete, right? So the nerves are soft. They're like wet noodles. If the tumor's like a rock, forget it. I mean, you can take the best sculptor in the world and give him a chisel, and do you think he can chisel concrete away from wet noodles without damaging the noodles? No. So you have to, as the saying, saying goes, you have to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Fortunately, with pituitary tumors, 95% of the time they're soft and you're able to peel them away. But sure, you could injure. I've never injured a carotid. I've had two instances where people have called me into the OR because of a carotid injury. Both cases, we're able to deal with it, but it's not a pleasant experience. So yeah, you know, you have to be careful. So the, the second question is, um, I think you were showing a transclival approach to the, um, looks like the brainstem. Yes. And so you can see the basal artery, et cetera. Can one also use this to also perform uh, brainstem surgery? Um, have you done that? You can. Um, it's a long reach, so if the tumor is exophytic and sticking out, yes, it's kind of a long reach to go in. Uh, but yes, I have done it once or twice, and it worked out okay, but you know, I think you have to be careful not to push too far. I should say that Dr. Fung is one of the reasons we do so well, because he's, he's pushed our imaging here to a highly advanced state. Now there's this whole new protocol where we can see things we never saw before because the resolution of the MRIs are so good. Here's a question. Do you indicate somatostatin analogs pre-surgery in acromegalic patients? Yes, I didn't have time to talk about medical management. Certainly, if you have a prolactin tumor, there's an option to treat this with medication and not surgery. There are pros and cons. That's a whole big debate, which we don't have time for. The somatostatin analogs have not generally given total control with acromegalics, and so I still always favor surgery. I have not, uh, I've had some experience with pretreatment with the somatostatin analogs, which shrink the tumor a little bit. It can help. Uh, I don't do, routinely do it, uh, and there are a few studies out where people think that it helps a little bit, so it's not a bad idea. Certainly, if somebody comes in on a somatostatin analog which reduces growth hormone and helps shrink the tumor, I don't take them off. I'm happy they're on it. Now, both prolactin and growth hormone tumors, if you treat them for more than six months and the tumors shrink, you get a lot of scar tissue. So I always tell patients, particularly prolactin tumors, if you want to take medicine and not do surgery, that's fine, but don't say I'm going to come back in a year because then it's going to be too hard for me to do it. As they say in Texas, you have to pick a horse and ride on it. Thanks so much for coming, and I uh, hope thank you for all the people who are watching. I hope there's a few of you.